Following our stop at City Point, we moved south, just as Grant did, to Petersburg, but this time to Petersburg National Park. Most of the Petersburg battlefield is now part of the growing city, but the Park Service has done a fine job of preserving key locations. In all, the Siege of Petersburg lasted a total of 292 days. While the Confederate forces played a long game of defensive trench warfare, the Federal troops slowly worked to cut off all of the Confederate supply lines. A large seacoast mortar, nicknamed the Dictator, could lob shells from this spot into the city of Petersburg. But, although it inspired fear through its sheer size, the Dictator proved strategically insignificant. The Petersburg Eastern Front Battlefield is dotted with small forts just like this, both Confederate and Union. Defensive devices called abati serve to slow down any direct assaults. And small shelters called bomb proofs could be used for protection during shellings from enemy artillery. Such defenses served to make the siege at Petersburg essentially a defensive stalemate. And unless some new strategy was devised, the siege would go on indefinitely. In June of 1865, Pennsylvania coal miners serving in the 48th Pennsylvania suggested that they might be able to build a mine under the enemy defenses and blow it up. And so, at Elliott Salient, a point where the Confederate and Union lines were exceptionally close, that's exactly what they did. They built a mine. Using improvised tools and fuses, they tunneled underneath the enemy defenses and packed their mine with 8,000 pounds of black powder. While the mine was under construction, the Union pickets created small diversions to dissuade the enemy from suspecting anything unusual. The close proximity of Union and Confederate lines can easily be seen in this photograph. Here we are looking back towards the Union picket line. The entrance to the mine lies between the grassy horizon and the tree line in the distance. Although the blast was delayed by a faulty splice in the fuse, the mine did detonate successfully. Today, many tourists are disappointed by the unspectacular remains of the blast, but one must remember that once the Confederates recaptured their salient, they immediately took to the task of re-establishing their original defensive works in the area of the crater. Confederate forces did suspect that a mine was being dug underneath their fortifications, but their countermines never went deep enough to confirm their suspicions. This monument is dedicated to William Mahone's Confederate soldiers who rushed two miles to defend Elliott's salient and to drive the Union troops from the crater. After leaving the Petersburg battlefield, we drove to Poplar Grove National Cemetery where only a small number of fallen Union troops have been identified by name. It is here in Poplar Grove Cemetery that Joseph Bellis a private in the 55th Pennsylvania and a collateral relative is buried. Bellis's grave is located underneath the pine tree just off to the central circle of the cemetery.
When we found it, the headstone for Bellus was completely buried in pine needles. Bellus died from a gunshot wound to the head while fighting at Petersburg. According to his military records, he died instantly. Joseph Bellis was originally buried on Friends Farm, but he was moved here when the Poplar Grove Cemetery was established just after the end of the Civil War. The next morning, we visited Five Forks, a key intersection of roads captured by General Phil Sheridan in an effort to cut the Confederate forces at Petersburg from their only remaining supply line, the South Railroad. It was at Five Forks that Sheridan captured thousands of troops under the command of George E. Pickett. Pickett and many of his officers were caught unaware while enjoying a shad bake several miles away. Without the presence of their commanding officers, the rebels succumbed to confusion, and those soldiers who were not captured simply ran away from the battle. Some historians report that Pickett might have been able to return to his command had he not been drinking too heavily during the Shadbake. Through his victory at Five Forks, General Sheridan severed the last remaining source of food for the already starving rebel soldiers at Petersburg. The next morning, General Grant launched an all-out attack on the rebel lines there, forcing the Confederates to abandon not only Petersburg, but Richmond as well, and initiating the Appomattox Campaign, the last campaign of the Army of Northern Virginia. The pursuit of Lee's army from Petersburg finally ended at Appomattox Courthouse. It was on the grassy hill in the distance that a Confederate messenger brought word of Lee's desire for a meeting to discuss terms of surrender. And so, on the 9th of April, 1865, Generals Grant and Lee met in the front parlor of the McLean House, where Lee agreed to the magnanimous surrender terms set forth to Grant by President Lincoln aboard the River Queen at City Point just a few days earlier.